Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Hamsa Shrikant, and I'm one of the two Athenaeum fellows this year. As we speak, President Trump is delivering the State of Union address in Washington, DC. Media outlets have been waiting with bated breath for this event, after Secretary of State Mike Pompeo revealed that Trump will make a, quote, significant announcement on the status of ISIS. Trump announced in December that the US would pull its troops from Syria, and the administration has made repeated claims that ISIS has been, quote, defeated. In 2014, ISIS controlled an area of land that was, that was the size of Britain, and it is true that the terrorist group has since lost significant territory. But the question on, on all of our minds still persists. Is the threat of ISIS truly over? Here to answer that question is our speaker tonight, Mark Jurgensmeyer. Mark Jurgensmeyer is a distinguished professor of sociology and global studies and affiliate professor of religious studies at UC Santa Barbara. Our speaker is also a pioneer in the global studies field, focusing on global religion, religious violence, conflict resolution, and South Asian religion and politics. He has published more than 300 articles and 20 books, including the award-winning book, Terror in the Mind of God, and his co-edited book, Oxford Handbook of Global Studies. Professor Jurgensmeyer will give an illustrated analysis of the rise of ISIS and discuss its current state and religious and global influence. His insights are all based on site visits to the region, extensive interviews, and surveillance of jihadi online chat rooms. Mark Jurgensmeyer's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Kewton Lectureship in Religious Studies at CMC. This is a 45-minute presentation, and there will be a Q&A at the end. As always, I must remind you that audiovisual recording is strictly prohibited. Please use this opportunity to silence your devices, stuff your face with bread, and adjust your seat if you've not already done so. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Jurgensmeyer. And I want to say how, what a pleasure it is to be back in Claremont Colleges. It's just a, a thrill to be here, not just because of the beauty of the campus, but because of the intellectual excitement of the students and the faculty. It's a really a rare uh, atmosphere, uh, academic, academic atmosphere. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you to talk about an interesting and somewhat troubling topic. This is a project that I've been working on for many years, and to follow the rise of ISIS has been uh, a fascinating thing. To follow its fall and its decline in some ways is even more interesting. Because the question is whether movements like this ever really end. And what happened to the people, what happened to the issues, what happened to the problems, what happens to the prospects of those who are involved in the movement to begin with. So that's our subject for tonight. Last year when I was in uh, Iraq uh, at the edge of Mosul talking with some people in uh, the resettlement camps that were hastily created along the border, I was talking with this guy who at one time was a supporter of ISIS. He was a Sunni Arab from Ramadi uh, and he said at first, you know, it's, it seemed like this was such a promise for, for Sunni Arabs. But he said ISIS was a strange religion. It was a strange religion, he said, but it was our religion. It was a Sunni religion. And I thought, what a remarkable thing to say. In some ways, so apt. Because if you look at the map of Iraq, you immediately figure out the geopolitics of the region. Iraq really has three different separate uh, ethnic communities, and they're divided both by religion and by ethnicity. Now, the difference between Shia and Sunni, for those of you who don't know much about Islam, is kind of like the difference between Protestants and Christians, uh, Protestants and Catholics and Christianity. And you're saying, yeah, but Protestants and Christians are, uh, Protestants and Catholics are all Christians, right? Yeah, but say that in Northern Ireland, and you can see that whether you're Protestant or you're Catholic can make a huge difference. Whether 
can determine whether you're going to be alive one night on your way home from work if you're assaulted by a crowd and they say, who goes there? Are you Protestant or you're Christian? Because along with that religious identity comes a whole host of other issues, some of them ethnic and some of them historic. And the same is true among the Shia and the Sunni in, um, in Iraq. They're both Arab, and they're both different from the Kurds in the north, who are, they're Sunnis also, but they're, they're ethnically Kurd, they speak a different language, they look different. So these are really, they're three different groups and they look different directions. The Shia look east towards Iran and you're saying, of course, well, they're all Shia. Yeah, except of course, in, in Iran, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. They speak a different language, they have a different culture. And yet, I think it's fair to say that the Shia in the east, southeastern portion of Iraq look east. It's fair to say that the Sunni Arabs in the western part look west. They look towards Syria, where the whole of the eastern part of Syria is Sunni Arab. The majority of people in Syria are Sunni Arab like them, and are in, are in Jordan or in Saudi Arabia. And, and the Kurds, of course, look north towards the other Kurds in Turkey and Iran. So they're really three different areas. You say, how on earth did they ever get together? Well, during the Ottoman Empire, there were all these different regions, and so there were, all, each of these regions has its own distinct characteristic. They didn't get lumped together into nation states until the end of the Ottoman Empire, which was the end of World War I, and the British and the French decided, well, they'd create nation states out of this, so they lumped together a whole section, they made that Syria, and they lumped together the other tribal regions on the other side of the Jordan, they call that Transjordan or Jordan, and then there was a section they wanted to, they wanted to save a place where Christians could be safe, so they called it Lebanon, and then there was kind of a big chunk left over and they called it Iraq. That's kind of how it came about. So all you have to do is look at this map and you can see that, that the current tensions in Iraq are kind of the leftover business of the attempt to create a nation states out of the Ottoman Empire 100 years ago. And what held Iraq together all that time were secular dictatorships, both in Syria and in Iraq. Secular, both cases, the Ba'ath Party, which is kind of a socialist party. And that worked fine, in a way, as ruthless as those dictators were, until this happened. This is the American invasion of Baghdad in 2003, shock and awe, where the pretense was supposedly the kind of secret weapons caches, the weapons of mass destruction which Saddam Hussein had and they weren't able to find and yet it gave the reason for invading uh, Iraq and then presumably to liberate the country. The problem was as soon as the country was liberated there were really good plans for what they were going to do afterwards and one of the first things that happened after the statue of Saddam Hussein was pulled down at Farouz Purdue Square in, in central Baghdad uh, was a whole different thing entirely. It was a kind of a mass um, plundering of government buildings where people came in and looted, they took things, they took the air conditioners, they took the they took the desk, they took the they took the copper wiring out of the buildings. And people all over Iraq observed this and they realized this place is falling apart. The country is in chaos. Americans have come to liberate us, but they're not putting anything in its place. And Iraqis were used to being ruled by governments that they didn't particularly like or trust, but this was a whole different level of anarchy. And they thought there must be something, there must be something afoot. And what was afoot, of course, was their sense that the American presence was out to do them in. There was a whole series of insurrections where discontent turns to fear and fear turned to a sense of, uh, of resistance. And resistance turns to terrorism uh, with one group after the other aiming at the American occupation. That's where I came to Baghdad in the spring of 2004 uh, with my colleague Mary Calder from London School of Economics uh, on the left of your picture here and that's our translator on the right. We're talking with this guy who's the head of the 
Association of Muslim Clerics of Al Anbar Province. This is the leading Sunni Arab uh, Muslim organization. And asking them the simple question, which is, what's going on? Why, why are Americans such a target of resistance? We can understand how anyone wouldn't be, want to be occupied by another country, but this is a whole another level of resistance. And what the mullah told us was that, you know, they had a theory. It was kind of a conspiracy theory that the reason the Americans came, they decided, it had nothing to do with oil, it had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, that it was because the Americans were secretly in league with Saddam Hussein, and then when that puppet wasn't performing, they wanted to get rid of him because they were afraid that the revolution was coming, the Muslim revolution that would bring Sunni Arabs into a whole new leadership, Muslims into power against this secular dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. And he said that's what the Americans didn't want to happen. They didn't want us to take over our own country. So behind this insurrection was the sense that the Americans were there to keep them from establishing a Muslim and Sunni state. Now, it's a little unrealistic in the sense that there only 20% of the population in Iraq are Sunnis. 60% are Shia, the other 20% are Kurds. And yet they felt that at least in that region that they had a certain primacy, they had a certain kind of heritage. They, after all, during Saddam Hussein's rule, all of the leadership was in Sunni hands, and they assumed that that would kind of happen. They realized that when George Bush talked about democracy in Iraq, what that meant to them, democracy means that the majority rules and the majority are Shia. It means winner take all. It means the Sunnis are going to be nothing. Democracy means that the Sunnis are going to be second class citizens in their own country. So when this guy came out of Jordan and he said, look, you Sunnis, you need to do something. You need to march together. You need to follow a new line. We're going to create our own Muslim kingdom after all. Follow me, Zarkari, Abdul Musa Zarkari, was a gangster in Amman, Jordan, he had tattoos, and yet he proclaimed that he was part of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda of Iraq. And Osama bin Laden, even though he kind of winced when he saw the tattoos and he didn't like the idea of the anti-Shia rhetoric, then, well, kind of nice to have more Al-Qaeda, right? Okay, okay, we'll put up with him. So there was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the insurrection spread like crazy. And the target, the target was a combination of Americans and Shia forces whom they were afraid they were going through the, under the rubric of democracy, take over Iraq and run it purely for the benefit of Shia, and those Sunni Arabs would be dirt. As, as I say, when I came to Iraq, we saw pictures like this on the television. Look familiar, you know, the prisoners often foreigners in orange jump shoots and behind them black clad people with the black flags and the decapitations that was happening under Zakari and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But it didn't last forever. One thing, Zakari was killed by American forces. They had to show a picture of his head in order to prove to people he really was killed. That's not really what killed off Al-Qaeda in Iraq, however. What killed off Al-Qaeda in Iraq was Quite a different thing was in a policy of the American military under General David Petraeus that President Bush announced as announced as the the, the surge uh, as a surge of forces, but those that was really a misnomer because the forces were only surged in the city of Baghdad. In the rest of Iraq, particularly in Al, in Al Anbar Province, it was just the opposite. The plan was to withdraw the American troops because they had become such a target of the resistance in western Iraq and replace it with the Sunni tribal leaders themselves and their own militia and the Americans would give them weapons to fight Zakari. Because this new Al-Qaeda in Iraq, they were as much of a threat to the old leadership, in the, the Sunni leadership in, 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 in Iraq as it was were to the Americans and the Sunni leaders wanted to reclaim their own authority so they were happy to take the weapons their own militia and fight against the Iraq and the Americans were happy to see Iraqis fighting Iraqis and they could just 
focus their troops on Baghdad where they became a kind of police force. And it was wildly successful. It's called the Awakening, where American troops moved out of Al Anbar province. The tribal leaders took over. They were given the weapons and the authority and the money in order to fight their own campaign. And they were successful, pretty successful, in getting rid of Al Qaeda in Iraq until this happened. I know this is a long-winded story, but it's all connected, and it all makes sense, and I want you to bear with me, because it all is relevant to what is happening to ISIS now, because in, the 19, in 2011, when in a plan that was worked out by Bush long before Obama became president, and then Obama carried it out, that eventually the American troops would withdraw, then they did, and then the Iraqis took over, and they were fully in charge under the leadership of this guy. This is actually my own picture. I interviewed uh, al-Maliki, oh, years before he became the leader in, in Iraq, when he was, I actually was disappointed that, that I was, I wanted to interview the leader of the Shia and the Sunni parties, and the, I couldn't interview the leader, so they kind of passed me off in the second-rate Shia party, the Dawa party, and the second-rate kind of office manager. That was al-Maliki. And fairly recently, I went back over the tapes listening to that interview, and one of the dullest interviews I've ever had. It just said absolutely nothing of interest. It was, uh, oh, yes, Shia and Sunni have always worked together. We will live together in harmony. Oh, yes, it will be peace. And I thank you very much. That's very interesting. But this guy, in part because he was so dull and so drab, the Americans and others supported him because they thought, oh, he's a good kind of, you know, he, he has no interest in power, he'll be a good kind of placeholder until we find somebody really good to lead the Iraq government. They underestimated al-Maliki, because he picked up a cue from Saddam Hussein, which is you rule by bribery and by intimidation and by having a good network of support, and he immediately started giving away plum jobs and office positions and military positions to people who knew nothing about the military, to his buddies, his Shiite friends. And the Shiites prospered under al-Maliki, and the Sunnis, you guessed it. Once again, they were second-class citizens. Once again, they were waiting for a savior to come out of the desert and to give new leadership. That's where this guy steps in. He was, in fact, with Saqqari, he was part of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And what al-Baghdadi was doing initially was simply reviving al-Qaeda in Iraq. Pictures on the left were pictures that the Americans took when he was briefly held under detention back in the old al-Qaeda in Iraq days. But then when he tried to revive the movement, by this time, <laughs> it was too late. And he let his beard grow out, and he stood in front of the main mosque in Mosul and proclaimed himself the great caliph of the new Islamic state. The caliph, I'm the king of the world. I'm the king, look at me, al-Baghdadi. Extraordinary megalomania, but who would follow such a person? Well, the answer is interesting, because there was a following, and he did have extraordinary military success. Uh, ISIS, which he renamed it after after he got in a fight with Osama bin Laden, and uh, Osama bin Laden says, look, you, got, you guys got to be nice with al-Nusra, this other kind of al-Qaeda group in Iraq. Why do you guys get together and al-Baghdadi said nuts to that. <laughs> We're gonna, we, don't, we don't need you, Osama bin Laden. We don't need al-Qaeda. We're changing our name. We're going to be the Islamic State. He proclaimed himself the Islamic State and was wildly successful. I mean, was just within... A matter of months, 1915, they suddenly were in charge of most of eastern Syria and western Iraq. Now, I know that when you look on a map, it looks like there's just a, you know, a spider web uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, ISIS extension, but that spider web is where people live. <laughs> most of, you know, I, when I would fly over from Amman, Jordan, into Baghdad, I remember looking out of these little planes down and just, just miles and miles of nothing. You know, there's just desert. <laughs> except for these little oases of streams and, and, and roads. And that's, of course, what ISIS held. And so when you see this kind of spider web of ISIS control, it really means that they controlled much more than that. And they controlled it with an interesting combination of things. One was ideological and a kind of vision of a, a certain kind of bizarre 
millenary and apocalyptic strand of, of, of Islam, which is part of Islamic tradition, but not a very popular one or a particularly pro prominent one. And yet, you know, it's within part of South, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, heritage and was something that was picked up by Al Baghdadi and expanded that they were part of this end of the world, you know, final days. It was kind of like the, uh, the end times, um, you know, prophecies within evangelical Christianity, and we could kind of plant that on to Islam, this kind of vision that they were at the end of days and they were creating a whole new world, the ISIS apocalypse. Uh, that had attraction to many, but for others it was simply, they got a job. You know, there were all of these members of, of Saddam Hussein's army. He had the largest army in the region. And when the Americans came in, part of the, the deal was that they wouldn't hire any of the old Baghdad army for the new army. They wouldn't hire any of the Ba'ath Party administrators for the new administration. So you had these literally tens of hundreds of thousands of people, competent people, military and administrators out of work. M many of them, most of them Sunni. So ISIS gave them jobs. ISIS provided, Mosul ran very efficiently under, under ISIS in part because it, the old Ba'ath Party administrators finally had their jobs again. <laughs> they, could, they could run the city and ran it pretty efficiently. So for many, it was just the, the lure of territorial control. And you can see the, the crowds of, these are ISIS supporters, but they're just ordinary Sunni Arabs who are looking for work, looking for a role, looking for dignity, looking for a, a role in public life, which they didn't have. There was some extreme, of course, of a lot of anti-Christian talk, a lot of anti-Shia. This is Shia Kafir, the enemy, you know, in front of a, of, of a Shia mosque. But it was this, I think, dominantly this sense of, of Sunni Arab uh, empowerment that propelled ISIS, both in Syria as well as in Iraq, because, of course, as I would have it, the same kind of uprising was happening in Syria with the Assad regime, where in Syria, the Sunni Arabs are actually the majority in the country, and yet the, the Assad regime being a kind of Shia, Alawites, um, and Christian supporters had, the, the Sunni also felt like second-class citizens. So you had this huge region of eastern Syria and western Iraq joined together for a time under ISIS control. And this is one of the, this map shows one of the largest extents of their control in 2015. By 2017 and by the beginning of 2018, the control, geographical control of ISIS had shrunk to very little. You can see how the kind of spiderweb ne network has is, is disappeared. A lot of the region in the north was liberated by Kurds, uh, both Kurds from Iraq and Kurds from Syrian Kurds, uh, that became a very effective fighting force uh, with the U.S. protection because both Turkey and Syria, and to some extent Iraq, Governments were all suspicious of, of the Kurds because they were afraid the Kurds would try to create their own separate government, their own separate region. And right after the end of the ISIS defeat in Mosul, in fact, Kurdistan and, and northern Iraq did try to proclaim itself as separate, and the Baghdad government went ber berserk. But despite that, and largely with American support, the Kurds were able to mount this effective this effective uh, resistance against ISIS control. So by the end of 17th, beginning of 18th, it was pretty much over. Uh, uh, I was there right at the beginning of 18 uh, when there was still fighting in Mosul, but as we came closer to the city, you could see the areas that ISIS had retreated from. These are my pictures of the um, bridges that had been uh, blown up by ISIS retreating, so you would have to ford around the the, the bridges. This is a, a village right outside of Mosul. <clears throat> and when I saw this picture, I stopped the, the Jeep. I asked the driver to stop so I could get out and, and take closer pictures. And he said, no, no, he said, don't, don't, don't put one foot outside of this car. And I said, why not? He said, you could blow it up. This place is full of landmines. So if you wanted to come back to the village, first of all, what did you do about the landmines? And then if you look at every building is destroyed in, in this village. 
there's no electricity, there's no water, there's, there's no means of rebuilding in the village. So yeah, ISIS is gone, but what are the people going to do? And the answer is, they go out here. These huge, these huge camps have been created almost overnight by the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees, and I have to say they've done an extraordinarily good job. They've gotten this whole refugee camp thing down absolutely, absolutely perfectly. You know, you, when you go into the camp, you'll see that the roads have been bulldozed and created with gravel strips, and, and as you can see on either side here, there are, uh, there are about 14 uh, uh, tents, and these are tents that are tall enough that you can actually walk inside. On either side, and in the middle there are, uh, is a big kitchen area, and then on either end there are uh, toilets for uh, facilities for both men and for women. And then they have big areas, playgrounds for kids, schools for kids, medical facilities. Uh, it's extraordinarily well done, but it's still a refugee camp. I mean, it's a well-done refugee camp, but still it's a refugee camp. So I was talking with these guys who were telling me what it was like to live under ISIS rule at Mosul. And they, saying at first they were Sunni Arabs, so at first they supported, they supported ISIS. They said they gave it, they, they, we had jobs. First time, he said, in years we've had jobs. So they did fairly well, except they said over time, ISIS began turning on them, on, on the Sunni Arabs in, in, in Mosul. They became become more and more paranoid, more and more suspicious. This guy on the left had been, had worked for a while as a civilian with the, the uh, Iraq government police, and when they, ISIS found out about it, he said he found himself in a, in a field one night, and then he didn't know why, why he was put there until he, other people in the field suddenly fell, started falling over, and he realized they were being shot. So he just fell down and played dead for a while until the shooting stopped and then he was able to sneak back up and he got his family and they got out of town as quickly as they could. This guy on the right was, went to jail for two months for smoking cigarettes. So he also <laughs> left when he had an opportunity to leave. And now here they are, now here they are. Now what? That, brings the question of what is the future. I mean, the ideal future, of course, is to deal with the problem that, that created ISIS in the first place, to find some role for Sunni Arabs within both Syrian and Iraqi public life. And that means both Damascus and Baghdad finding a way both politically, changing the constitution in some ways, in the case of Iraq, and being more open, giving more benefits to the, the people of all regions, to finding a way to get them more in control of their own lives. That would, that's the ideal plan, uh, where Arab Sunnis abandon ISIS, but Baghdad and Damascus embrace the Sunnis. I call this plan A, integration. Well, that's not happening. What about plan B? Plan B would be if you create a whole new uh, Sunnistan, because as I said, Eastern Syria and Western Iraq, primarily Sunni Arabs, Back in the Ottoman Empire days, you know, the, those were kind of contiguous regions. Why don't you put them together now and create a new nation? Call it, I just made it up, Sunnistan or something like that, you know, that would be a place where Sunnis can run their own country. But of course, in, uh, my, in my fantasy, <laughs> my fantasy, both, both Iraq, uh, Baghdad, and Damascus would be happy to get rid of the Sunnis, right? So this way, Baghdad could keep the richest part of Iraq and, you know, the you know, Shia majority and that. You know, Bashar al-Assad to keep the Christians, the Alamites on the coast, the richest part of Syria, and just let the Sunnis have their own place. That's not going to happen either. <laughs> so much that there's no indication you need Saudi, Turkish, Iran involvement. No indication they're moving in that direction. Which leads us to Plan C, which is really no plan at all. Plan C is that you kind of defeat ISIS militarily, but nothing happens. You go to Ramadi and Fallujah, two towns have been liberated from ISIS now for a couple of years, nothing has happened. They have not rebuilt the cities. The cities are still a mess. The people are still out of work. The Sunnis still feel like second class citizens. All the conditions that gave rise to the ISIS in the first place continue. The only Difference is that without ISIS control, the tribal leaders have now taken a more traditional role 
and providing the kind of leadership in the vacuum of power, in the vacuum of leadership, in the absence of integration of Sunnis in the public life in both Syria and Iraq that they had before, which can be thought of as a step in the right direction, but will that last forever? For one thing, ISIS hasn't really gone. There are at least 30,000 by U.S. military account guerrilla fighters still. I get a kind of update of, of ISIS in, uh, in, in Iraq <clears throat> daily. And every day there are incidents. Every day there are killings. There are guerrilla attacks. And sometimes, you know, half a dozen. They don't, they don't make the New York Times because there's all little attacks. But they're still there. There are pockets of land right along the Syrian-Iraq uh, border that are still under ISIS, ISIS control. So ISIS is still there. It hasn't left. He could say, well, it's getting smaller. Yeah, maybe. Maybe if no new people join them. But the U.S. is moving out. <laughs> and as it moves out, the, the Kurdish network that has been controlling ISIS and the, controlling the expansion of ISIS is now seriously degraded and is under threat itself by Syria, by Turkey, by the Iraq government. So it's not just, oh, we've done our job, mission accomplished, our soldiers have done their job and they can now leave. You're leaving a situation now where the, the Kurds no longer have the support, which is really terrible for them. It's extremely irresponsible after they've done the heavy lifting of the fighting against ISIS to be abandoned, but also means that you now have the opportunity for ISIS to continue to expand. And then there are these people. Now these people are all the, this extraordinary jihadi network that ISIS fostered, uh, largely online, uh, through uh, internet connections, through Twitter uh, accounts, it brought young people all over the world into the region to be fighters for a time. I mean, truth be told, they were just cannon fodder. I mean, poor people would be recruited and they'd think, oh, we're going to the glorious war, we're going to great fight the great, for the great caliph. And, and I remember at the beginning wondering why al-Baghdadi would want these people, because foreigners make terrible soldiers. They don't know the language, they haven't been trained. What the devil is going to do with them? Then I realized, oh, I know what he's going to do with them. You'll put suicide belts on them, throw them out in the front line, let them blow themselves up, and that'll take care of that. You don't have to worry about integrating them into the army, and you've got an extremely effective military force. If you have people who are willing to blow themselves up, they can do all kinds of stuff. You can take a very small military force, which is ISIS always had compared with the Syrian or Iraqi military, and just scare the crap out of the huge military enterprise because you have people who are willing to just stand up in front of you and blow themselves up. And a lot of them were people like this, all of whom, by the way, you look at them, foreigners from all over Europe and North Africa, they're all dead. They never last more than a couple months. Now, some of them are still alive, and there is this broader network uh, that was fostered through the glossy online mag magazines like the Tabik and and particularly, uh, not just through the magazine articles, it glorified the martyrs and it glorified the great cause, the attractiveness, but I have a, a couple of my students who speak Arabic and are from Middle Eastern back, backgrounds who are online interacting on these jihadi networks and they've come up with some of the things you're going to see. That there's, uh, there on Twitter and on Telegram, which is a Twitter kind of uh, forum, and also in Tor, which is the kind of the dark web, there are all these, uh, social networks where there's jihadi conversation, an extraordinary kind of communication of this network of people uh, who, who are kind of, they thrill each other. They kind of feed on each, each other's enthusiasm for this imaginary war, this great battle in which they're involved. I, I told some people in, uh, in earlier when we were talking about how this, uh, my students were in contact with this kid in Toronto, Canada, who's 16 years old. And the kid said, you know, he was on, he was in, on a jihadi network with all these, uh, these people online. He said, my, my parents are trying to take away my computer. They found out. And he says, but it's not going to work. He says, because I have other ways of getting online. He says, Be besides, I've got to. He says, this is the only community I've ever known. These are the only friends I have. 
He says, I feel more real when I'm online with this jihadi network, which you call Bakaya, the family. I'm more online when I'm with this family than with my own family or with people I know in school. What an extraordinary thing to say. I mean, you could see how people individually who are marginalized for whatever reason, personal or social or because of their in an expatriate community of less than friendly neighbors, they would feel a life, feel an identity, feel a connection online. And these people continue. They're still online. They're still, my students are still in contact with them. The chatter has not stopped. Uh, it, it's gone away from, they're not focusing on Iraq and Syria so much anymore. Now they're talking about the Philippines. They're talking about Africa. They're talking about the United States. They're talking about France, you know. Or this is last year uh, where uh, an ISIS supporter took a truck and drove down the wrong way of a, of a bike path in Manhattan. And when the, the truck stopped and he tumbled out, he left a note behind saying, ISIS is alive. Well, maybe ISIS isn't fully alive, but it's certainly alive in this kind of far-flung, imagined uh, cyber community where reality is only as real as your perception of it. And then there are people who lived in these cities that have been liberated. This is Mosul. This is Mosul after, after the end of the bombing. This is Mosul. I, you can't go back to that. There's no money for rebuilding it. These cities are not going to be rebuilt, certainly not very quickly. Where are all the people? They're all people are with these guys that I talked with this last year, and I'm going back to Iraq in next about three weeks. And I'm going to Mosul. I'm going to try to follow up on some of the contacts I've made there. But these, so I asked these guys, what are you going to do next? <laughs> you know? And they said, well, of course we want to go back, but there's, there's nothing to go back to. And I said, well, what's going to happen? And he said, well, some people are going to turn to ISIS again. He said, right here in the refugee camp. I've talked to people. They're thinking about it. He says, you know, we were so angry. We were just so angry. We're angry at the Iraq government. We're angry at the Americans. Yeah, they liberated us, but look what they did. They liberated, but they took away our cities. We took away our homes. We took our took away our families, our friends. What's going to happen? I don't know. Is ISIS over? Is ISIS over? I don't know. That's, a, that's the question for all of us. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. We're going to have a little discussion. We now have time for questions. We have a few guidelines for you. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question. One of us will bring the mic to you. Please stand up when you ask your question. And priority will have to go to students. Hi, thank you for uh, coming to speak with us uh, today about this topic. So in your plan B in creating a sort of Sunni stone, how would this plan sort of succeed and why is it not feasible? Well, first of all, let, let me say, is it my life? First of all, I think I'm the only one you know, who's a proponent of this Plan B. Because even though uh, I said you know, maybe Baghdad and Damascus would be happy to get rid of Sunni regions, they haven't been racing to this as a, as a live opportunity. Uh, and as I said, it would also take, realistically, the coalition of, of support from Turkey and, and Iran and Russia major players in the region uh, in order for such a thing to be viable. And then, of course, it would take a massive amount of international aid, which is where the United States presumably would come in if the United States was really interested in trying to develop some sort of stable and lasting peace within the region. But since it would be a Sunni government and a Sunni region that has at least not so far, been very hospitable and friendly to Americans. <laughs> I can't easily see any American government, uh, uh, forget about the present one, but uh, any American government uh, quickly jumping in at this uh, opportunity. 
So I think there's so lots of reasons why it wouldn't work. And as I say, I think I'm probably the only proponent of it. Because <laughs> it seems like a cool idea, but it's not going to work. <laughs> I, oh, yes. No, you got it. You got it. Sure. All yeah, right. go for it. Right. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Why don't you turn sideways so everybody yeah. can see it? <laughs> thank you for the talk. It's been excellent. Um, so if you were able to get into the room with Trump right now, what would you recommend for him? Uh, read your intelligence reports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, gee. Uh, clearly, any American president should be cognizant of the impact of, of, of American decisions. And although I'm certainly sympathetic with the idea that we want to bring our US troops back from the region and also back from Afghanistan. The trick is to do it in such a way that's not going to create more chaos as a result. Uh, and right now, uh, Iraq and Syria are poised between three very ambitious international actors, Iran, Russia, and Turkey, all three of which are very eager to maintain their and extend their stakes within the region. Uh, and the Kurds, unfortunately, are the biggest uh, obstacle to their success, which is tragic because, as I said, the Kurds, first of all, because the Kurds are wonderful people and they've been dealt such a bad you know, uh, card in, in history by not ever having had the opportunity to have their own country or their own region, uh, but also because they were the ones who were the major force in the, in the defeating ISIS. Uh, but right now, um, when I go to Iraq in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Erbil, I'll be going to Kurdistan, so I'm sure I'll get an earful of their concerns uh, about this. So I think I tell him what people have been telling him, and I think what he has been hearing, because this uh, Twitter announce, this Twitter announcement that we're going to move out of Syria immediately has now been modified a little bit with, oh, well, after a while, and oh, well, uh, we're going to immediately come back in if ISIS regains its, uh, uh, you know, its, uh, its footing, which, by the way, it certainly will, particularly if the, if the Kurds are, uh, are kind of demobilized. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you. So you had t touched on um, the power of social media, especially for ISIS. So right. I kind of wanted to throw it back to when the fighters first start, uh, were on their way to siege Mosul, and the big hashtag was all eyes on ISIS. And that actually hit, in within 24 hours, the number one trending item on Twitter um, for the Arab-speaking world. So um, I was just kind of wondering, how do we change that narrative? How do we like stem the influence of ISIS on social media, since that's so um, huge, to their, huge to their aims? And then also, how does that curb the flow of recruits? And not just what ought to be done, but who ought to do it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think the, latter, the last question is probably the most interesting, because uh, America's ability to manipulate public uh, attitudes are, uh, through uh, kind of public relations and media influence uh, is extremely marginal and often counterproductive. Uh, the American military helped to create the problem in the first place in the way that I've just described. Uh, I think it does have a role in trying to come up with long-range solutions, uh, but those, uh, that long-range solution, I think, has to have some sort of equitable role for Sunni leadership within both Syria and Iraq. And that means working, first of all, working with Iranians, to some extent Russians, but particularly Iran in both Damascus and Baghdad. They probably have the single largest influence, which I think was what the Obama administration was aiming for in part with this rapprochement over the nuclear uh, arrangement because even at the time there was talk about how this was really only part of a larger strategy to work with Iran in the rebuilding and restructuring of Iraq and, and Syria. Uh, and I think that would it clearly is, uh, is an appropriate route to go. Current administration by backing off from Iran, showing no interest whatsoever <laughs> in working with Iran, I think it makes it really very difficult for Americans to have any kind of leverage in the, in the region, any. You know, all, all they can do is have pamphlets or uh, you know, uh, these uh, counter-terrorism videos uh, that they expect people to see online, uh, which between you and me are 
worthless. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not worthy. Now, what I just said, not everybody would agree with, but that's my opinion. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about. Um, I hear voices, but I don't. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I thought we were, they were in my head for a second. <laughs> I was really interested in your slide about your interviews with the Sunni, the Sunni Muslim men in the refugee camps, uh -huh. and I'm curious, did, were you able to get interviews with any women that might have lived through that same experience, and if so, what was their take? Uh, y yes, um, the I talked with quite a few women actually. Um, the uh, the women I, in general shared the opinion of of the men. The w women were. I can generalize, more concerned about keeping their families together. Uh, probably the most moving, I did have slides, but I didn't show that, were um, women that I, I met who were Yazidi, uh, who had been in Sinjar. And Yazidi is a, a religious community. It's an ancient religious community, kind of sun worshiping. Uh, and for that reason, they're regarded by some Muslims as devil worshipers. And uh, so ISIS was able to claim that the Yazidis were devil worshipers, therefore they could be taken into slavery, and even worse, the women could be taken into sex slavery. And so I talked with uh, a couple of mothers who had told me just uh, deeply moving stories of how they rescued their daughters, how they protected their daughters from being sold into, into sex, uh, sold. I mean, they'd be taken to warehouses and raveled off. She said, for just a few dollars to some dirty old men, I'm quoting what, what the mothers would tell me and how they were able to hide out their, their daughters who were right there, I could see them, they, made, they made it, they were out. Uh, and, and how, how she was uh, uh, you know, hoping now for a better future. Now the problem is they can't go back to Sinjar either, Sinjar. I mean, it's been destroyed like, like the other towns that have been rescued that you have to destroy them in order to rescue them. Uh, so uh, when I talked with them, they were in a camp in Diyarbakar uh, in Turkey, uh, which is the largest, uh, uh, Sinjar uh, camp, I mean uh, Yazidi camp. That's the reason why I went there. I just was really interested in the fate of the Yazidi population. S some of the Yazidi women, by the way, have been so articulate, women who had been taken into sex slavery and they've come out. I, I was at uh, uh, Soleimani, a city in Iraq, uh, a little over a year ago where I gave a talk at, to Muslim clergy, who had uh, an association of Muslim clergy, to talk about intolerance and extremism in Islam. And before I talked, they had uh, a Yazidi woman talk who, who looked over at the sea of 400 Muslim clergy and just blasted them for, where were you, she said, when Islam was treated like dirt and they, and they took me and they used me you know, uh, for sex slavery. Where were you to, uh, and they said, well, I, we never supported ISIS. Yes, but you, <laughs> you didn't complain, you didn't fight. You know? uh, it was just a very, uh, very dramatic woman, uh, where she was able to uh, to fire them up and, and show them that that even kind of allowing, not speaking up, even allowing this to, their silence to go on was a, a, an act of outrage and had allowed her to be treated in the way that she sh she should. And yet there she was speaking. I mean, she was just man. They, I, she had all my admiration <laughs> because the. In, in the whole ISIS situation, the women have suffered some of the worst. It's terrible, and, but bravely. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering if you think that radicalization can be uprooted through economic development programs. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Um, do you think that radicalization can be uprooted through economic development? Oh, uh, that is a factor, uh, you know, we talked about this at, at uh, Gaston's class about w what does religion have to do with it? And uh, as I think you probably picked up from my talk, there's a religious component. I mean, the whole idea of apocalyptic uh, Islam and kind of the end of the world, and it animates a certain crowd within the movement, but a certain crowd. Because for most of the followers, it was economic op opportunity, the opportunity to, you know, Get, get a job and to be somebody. And so economic development, particularly insofar as it engages the, the workforce, the Sunni workforce that's been deprived because, largely because of the US 
government policy that restricted Ba'ath administrators and uh, and uh, former uh, military from being part of the new administration, the new military of a post-Saddam regime. Uh, the, yes, it, it would make it. Uh, I think it would make a huge difference. These things are complicated. It's never. Oh, it's all about economics. Well, no, it isn't. It's all about religion. No, it isn't. It's about economics and religion and pride and, and ostracism and the sense of exploitation and, you know, these are complicated pictures and they have different dimensions to them. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your talk today. Uh, my question kind of revolves around how today, most of what you were talking about was ISIS in Syria, specifically, or Islamic State in Syria, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think the future of the Islamic State is in other places, such as the Philippines, Libya, and currently even Nigeria, where they recently took over uh, an elite base of the Nigerian military? Yeah, there are these other outfits called uh, ISIS. Uh, they're, they're largely local. Uh, groups like Boko Haram that has kind of taken the name ISIS as a, a way of, a funny kind of way of legitimizing it, uh, but there's no central control from within uh, ISIS uh, in, in Syria. The reason I know this, I'm working now on, the, what the project I'm working on right now is how uh, terrorist movements come to an end. And I'm looking at three cases in particular. One is ISIS, and I said I'll be going back to, uh, back to uh, uh, Kurdistan next, in a couple weeks, three weeks. Um, a, a second is uh, the Khalistan movement, which I know is not a jihadi movement, but it's the one in Punjab that I began with because I used to live in the Punjab and I got all involved in trying to figure out the, you know, Binnerwali and the whole Khalistan movement. And I've been talking with people there about how the movement came to an end and whether it really is ended because as you, as you may know, I don't know how co closely you're connected with the Punjab, but Okay, <laughs> okay, but uh, as you know, there is a kind of resurgent movement in Canada, but also in Chandigarh and Jalandra and places like that. And the third um, case that I'm looking at is the uh, M Mindanao movement, the movement for a, a Muslim Mindanao in southern Philippines. And I've been going there also, talking with people, in including uh, this last year there was a faction of uh, the militant Muslim movement who had joined with ISIS, who took over the town of Marari in uh, Mindanao. And the Philippines government came in and they thought they would just easily extricate it from the city, but it didn't work out that well because they had infiltrated the whole city. So they ended up, the Philippine government using uh, American military, they bombed the hell out of it. They just totally destroyed the city, just like it looks like Mosul or, or, or Raqqa. He's just absolutely destroyed city. So I went there to try to figure out what was going on. And for one of the things I figured out is the number of ISIS, that is foreign ISIS people were very small. There were just a few. There's some people from Jordan and some people from Libya, but very few. And also they didn't integrate well with the fighters because they didn't know the language. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's understandable. The foreign fighters are really not very useful unless you just use them for suicide attacks. And, you know, throw a suicide bell and throw them out there. But it, it, so it, the, it, it was really, ISIS is really a kind of name to give a radical street cred to a group that was just an extremist branch of the moral independence movement itself. But as in Mosul and Raqqa, after the Philippine government did its dirty work of destroying the city, now you've got a whole host of new young people who want to become radicalized because they're really pissed off at what the Philippine government has done. And you can understand the feeling, you know. <laughs> they, maybe they didn't have any particular political sentiment, but suddenly in comes the government and it destroys your city and kills your friends. You're going to be pretty unhappy. So now the movement has a new leash on life, um, in part because of the extreme action of the government in trying to get rid of it. Uh, is it ISIS? I don't think so. I don't think the same way Boko Haram is not ISIS in in uh, uh, in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, or or the the movement in Maghreb, Al Qaeda in Maghreb is not really ISIS, but it has taken on the name to kind of give it a sense of affiliation. The same with uh, uh, Al Shabaab in, in Somalia, for example. Hi.
Okay. Um, so when ISIS was building its uh, outreach strategy, let's call mm -hmm. it, uh, to what degree did it rely on past ideologies of terrorist movements like Abdus Salam Faraj or um, Said Qutb or Timothy McVeigh? And to what, do, to what degree did it build its own kind of scholarly body to um, create a kind of an ideology for the movement when it was expanding internationally and in Iraq and Syria? Are you talking about the, the <coughs> kind of apocalyptic millenarian ideology? You're talking about the kind of the organizational strategy? Uh, no, the, the apocalyptic millenarian ideology and the justifications for their um, attacks abroad, A as in, in France and Belgium and whatnot. Th they're actually two separate questions. I mean, the uh, apocalyptic imagery, this has been around for a while. This is, uh, I mean, most religious traditions, you find some strange little group that you know, like Christians with the sign saying, the end of the world is near, you know, it's about to come, or uh, actually it's gotten larger. The, I don't know whether you followed the, the end times uh, novels, the, bar, the uh, left behind novels. Uh, maybe if you have some evangelical friends in your family, they've heard about, it. these are the largest selling books in recent history in the United States. They've topped the New York Times list for years in some cases. And you've never heard of them because most people are not in touch with this kind of evangelical apocalyptic subculture that's very lively in the United States. Most people didn't even realize them, that they existed until <laughs> they voted in huge numbers for the current administration and the kind of one of the backbones of this is, is, is popular support. But one of the tenets of this, uh, this idea is that the rapture is coming, the end of the world is coming soon, and with the end of the world is going to be great warfare, great fighting, uh, Israel is going to be very important because that's where the, you know, the Antichrist is going to wage war. That's one of the reasons why they want to defend Israel, why Israel is very important. You've got to move American embassy into Jerusalem. Wait a second, all this stuff is beginning to make sense <laughs> that we see politically. But so in Christianity, there is this, this whole trajectory. There is, uh, there's a millenary strain in Hinduism. There's a millenary strain in um, in Buddhism, uh, and, and there is a military strain in both Shia and, and Sunni Islam, and this so this been around for a while. He's resuscitated it and made it. What's different is he's made it into a kind of political uh, strategy, and and actually created the Islamic State, the Caliphate. Hasn't waited till the end of times until the Mahdi returns or whatever. It's here, man. It's the, you can come and join it. You can actually be in the Caliphate. Whoa, you can. It's there. Yeah, sure. Come on over. That's, a, that's what's really different, and that's what gives it a uh, kind of international appeal where they, you know, they can say, this is not just a wild idea, this is actually happening, you can come and see it at work. Hi, thank Hi. you for coming to speak today. Um, part of David Petraeus's sentiment was nation building is like eating soup with a knife. <laughs> I was wondering if you think we're doing an effective job at nation building or what we could be doing better or what your thoughts are on the process. No, we're doing a lousy job. Probably just stop trying to nation build if that's, so <laughs> that's the way we're doing it. I mean, there are obviously, it seems to me things that, that the, any powerful government like the United States could do, but it's going to have to do it in concert with other powerful governments, particularly ones that ha have influence in the region, this is why Iran is so critical to both Syria and uh, in Baghdad, because it has the ear of Shia leaders in, in both, uh, both countries. So, uh, uh, and it, it is, I think, uh, was when, uh, when there were these kind of, this re rapprochement between the United States and Iran, there was a, an interesting moment during the rise of ISIS when, uh, Al when this Maliki guy that I showed a picture of was, was t taken, tossed out of office and a new guy came in, it was kind of clear that Iran had, was playing a role in the background. Um, Soleimania, who was one of the leading generals, uh, the leader of the Quds Force in Iran, was in uh, uh, Baghdad at the time. So uh, there's kind of some uh, suggestion that there uh, was some secret deals with the United States military or CIA or something. I don't know. I don't have access to that kind of information. 
but uh, but my hunch is that there there were some some deals like that being made, and that's actually I think very positive because it, it shows that there uh, an attempt to try to use the Iranian influence to get the government to being more open to the needs of involving the Sunnis, which I think is absolutely essential for any kind of long-term success of peace in the region. Uh, but, it's, but it can't be accomplished by, certainly not by the United States by itself. Uh, the United States could play a role, uh, but it has to be with a whole coalition of forces of influences on those two governments. Hi, um, does the UN have a uh, plan for their refugee camps and what role do you see the UN playing in the near future? I'm sorry, I get it in. Does the question. UN have a plan for their refugee camps and what role do you see the UN playing in the future? Well, the, the UN doesn't have, the UN is just there to help. And it's going to, those, those refugee camps will stay as long as they, they're, as long as they're refugees, as long as people need a place to stay. And as I say, they've done a, a, a wonderful job but I've also been to uh, refugee camps in Jordan, uh, which have been around a lot longer, like five years. Uh, it, I've been to the, like, the largest refugee camp uh, in Jordan. And when I was there, I was going to go inside and do some interviews, and I, as soon as I got to the edge of the, the camp, I realized there's no way I can go inside. The, the place was a madhouse. Immediately swarmed with kids. There were uh, you know, people swarming all over the taxi. They wanted money. Uh, you, you, you had to go in with an armed guard. And I was thinking, what's the difference between this refugee camp and the one you, you saw pictures of? It's time, really. I mean, in the, the, the camp I showed pictures of, they have only been up for a couple months. And people had just gotten to those camps. And when they just get there, they are just so happy to be alive. They're happy to be alive, the kids are adjusting, things are kind of, after five years, you're no longer living in a refugee camp, you're living in a ghetto. And you've got kids who have been <laughs> raised, you know, they've, they may have been eight years old and now they're, now they're beginning to be teenagers and they're beginning to you know, see the world differently and they're, they're organizing into gangs and then they're organizing into, it's not a healthy environment, is what I'm saying. And, and you could easily see how not just gang warfare but new forms of ISIS type organizations could could easily develop in such uh, unfortunate situation. And I don't see any other option because those cities are not being rebuilt. The money isn't there. Even Ramadi and Fallujah, these two central towns in Al Anbar province that were supposedly liberated a couple years ago, they're still almost un uninhabitable. So if that's if that's the future, then you have a huge section of the Sunni population who not only feel like they were second-class citizens, but now feeling like they are you know, put in prison camps and incarcerated for simply their ethnicity. And that's just uh, uh, it's a terrible prospect for the future. Hi. Um, so on the one hand, you stressed about the losing their homes. As you just said, the cities are not being built, so they have no place to go to. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you were talking about um, them looking for an ideology and therefore the prospect of uh, radicalization again. And uh, you, know, you must pardon my ignorance, but I was really wondering what about uh, alternative kinds of ideologies that must or might exist in the region? Are there any liberal people among the Sunnis? Are there liberal Shias? Do the Sunnis and Shias talk to each other? Are there common voices? Is there some kind of platforms that are being created apart from the Islamic ones, apart from the ones that you described? Uh, yes, I mean, there. Are <coughs> back in the old Saddam era, there were secular political parties. They were Marxist parties, they were labor parties, they were uh, but after the fall of Saddam, uh, w w the, the political organizing quickly coalesced around ethnic and religious grounds because that was the easiest way to organize. Uh, 
It was the easiest way of making connections, getting in uh, uh, support. So the major political parties now are all, you know, around lig religious lines. But this is not necessarily a bad thing, getting back to are there more moderating forces. The, the clergy of, I, I, like, the clergy, when I, I interviewed, I showed a picture of, was uh, the head of the Al Anbar, um, uh, Association of Muslim Cler Clergy of Al Anbar Province. They're, they're great people. They're very responsible people. They, they're the ones who turned against Al Qaeda. They don't see this kind of extremism in their interest. Quite the opposite. I mean, ISIS killed these people. ISIS is not built on the normal Muslim clergy of the region, just the opposite. They were subjected, cruelly subjected to I, ISIS. It's not a clergy-based movement. And, and people don't wrap their heads around, oh, it's a Muslim movement. It's like, oh, the Muslim Brotherhood is, but Muslim Brotherhood doesn't have a clergy in it either. I mean, it's, these are movements of Muslim ideology, but they're not based on the clerical network. And the clerical, like Fallujah is called the city of mosque. I mean, the, the traditional clergy have very uh, important role to play in the social structure of the city. And, and given the, if the city was allowed to and could uh, be restored, then these people would have a very important moderating uh, effect to play. They would play the kind of traditional moderate Muslim leadership that they've been playing all their lives. Uh, and, and they should be allowed to be restored to that position. But as long as there's this kind of social chaos and there is no city and people are living in tents in, in, a, um, in, in these big refugee camps, then that, that you've broken apart, you've disrupted the whole social structure. You've, disrupt, you've broken apart the traditional role that moderate clergy played and this opens up all uh, possibilities for whole new extremist movements to come into play. That's, that's what disturbs me. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you spoke a little bit about the US's decision to pull out of Syria, and I was wondering how exactly you think that will affect the Kurdish population and US-Kurdish relations in the future. It'll be horrible. You know, it would be just devastating to, and, and, and I'm not sure that's going to happen because I mean, this is such a, a crazy presidency where, you know, things, pronouncements come out and tweet, and then what actually happens sometimes is a little, is a lot different. And uh, I think that, or at least I hope that, there will be um, greater protection to the, the Kurds and that this will not allow an uh, for like a mass slaughter or a <clears throat> kind of marginalization of the Kurds. I mean, the worst would be mass slaughter, where they actually be killed, uh, which is possible, particularly the Turks, who regard, regard them as, as uh, terrorists. Uh, and the Iraq government, I mean, the Syrian government has been kind of not really favorably disposed to it, but now it, it turns out the Kurds are kind of looking towards the Syrian government as opposed to Turkey, you know, as, as maybe they can work out some sort of alliance with them. Um, so it's a very precarious moment uh, for the Kurds. And as I said, I, I'll learn more about that in a couple of weeks when I'm there, and I, I'll get, I'm sure I'll get my earful, uh, you know, their woes and what their concerns are, but they're in big trouble right now. We talked ourselves out. <laughs> if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking Professor Mark Jurgensmeyer. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs>